So let me just point out, we have this demand for labor, which we've now shown is the marginal revenue product. Um, in the case of being perfectly competitive in the output market, we could use value of marginal product, which is price times marginal product. Otherwise, we could always use the general form of marginal revenue times marginal product. So remember, that means if you are a monopoly in the output market, that means you're using marginal revenue product instead of price times marginal product, and marginal revenue is always less than price. Um, so that value would be lower, other things being equal if you're a monopoly compared to if you're perfectly competitive, but either way, you're still using the marginal revenue product as your demand for labor. And there's basically going to be two things that'll shift this curve um, in, in these kinds of examples. So either it's going to be the price of the product. So remember, this marginal revenue product is price times marginal product or marginal revenue times marginal product. Um, so if, if the price of the product that I'm selling goes up for some reason, so maybe there's a demand shift in the output market, that's going to in turn cause a demand shift in the input market. So that's why this is sometimes called derived demand. The demand for this input is derived from what's happening in the output market. So if the output that I'm selling is more valuable, then any particular quantity of labor is also more valuable because the value of the marginal product or the marginal revenue product is now higher for any given quantity of labor. Um, so they're going to still produce some certain amount based on marginal product, and if I could sell it for a higher price, then that value is higher, so that would be a shift in my demand for labor. Um, and the other possibility usually would be something causing marginal product to change. So the other part of marginal revenue product, some kind of productivity increase would also shift my demand for labor. So if something's causing me to be able to, to produce more units for a given quantity of labor and then selling it for some price, um, that would also increase that value and increase my demand for labor. So now let's relax one of these assumptions. Um, so remember, we were assuming that we were perfectly competitive here in the labor market. Now let's assume we're not. So, and we're going to go to the extreme case of a monopsony. Um, so a monopoly is one seller, a monopsony is one buyer. So remember, in the labor market, we're a buyer as a firm. We're hiring labor. So now if we're the only buyer, that's what's called a monopsony. Um, it might be worth just comparing to what's going on with Monopoly in terms of price and marginal revenue. So remember what's going on is that if I want to sell one more unit of output, I have to drop the price because I'm facing the whole market demand for my product. And I, since I'm a single price Monopoly, I have to drop the price on all of my output, which means the extra revenue is not the price once I account for that price effect. The, the marginal revenue is going to be below the price, um, it's, so it's going to add less to my revenue than whatever the price is on that last unit that I'm selling. So price was greater than marginal revenue for a monopoly selling output. Now we're the only buyer of labor, so it's sort of the reverse of a monopoly, which is why it's useful to think about what's going on here. So instead of facing that perfectly elastic supply of labor because we're one of many firms, even though, remember, the market supply of labor was still upward sloping, but the firm faced that perfectly elastic supply of labor. Um, now we're the only buyer, we're going to face the entire market supply of labor. So instead of facing this kind of supply curve, we're going to face the whole upward sloping supply curve of labor. So now what this is telling you is, unlike the perfectly competitive case, if I want to hire one more worker, I have to raise the wage. I have to attract that next worker by raising the wage because we're assuming we have this upward slope so that people are only willing to increase that supply of labor, um, the quantity supply of labor, if the wage is higher. So someone in the market needs a higher wage in order to enter this market, for example. So. If I'm a single price, a single wage firm, and I'm going to pay the same wage to all of my workers, um, then what's going to happen is if I want to raise the wage to hire that next worker, I have to raise the wage to all my workers, which is why 
the marginal factor cost is going to be above that wage, right? So I have to raise the wage to get that next worker, but now I have to raise the wage to everyone because I'm paying one wage in this particular market. That's why the marginal factor cost is now above that wage. So it's sort of the reverse of what was happening here. So we have kind of this price effect happening just in terms of wages. So marginal factor cost, and it really has the same kind of relationship as these two curves, which is why it sort of looks like an upside down version of that. Um, so again, keep raising the wage, but I have to raise the wage to everyone, and that price effect gets bigger and bigger, you know, the more workers I'm hiring. So um, it's going to cost more and more to add one more worker, right? So what I really care about is what is it going to cost me to add the next worker? Well, I have to look at this. Um, I have to look at the marginal factor cost of adding one more worker. Right Back when I was perfectly competitive in the labor market, it was just the way I was a wage taker. I could hire as many workers as I want, so adding one more worker there wasn't this price effect happening, or this wage effect, maybe we can call it. Um, I just have to pay the wage to get one more worker. Now I have to raise the wage, I have to raise the wage to everyone, and so what I have to look at is um, that marginal factor cost curve. So I was jumping ahead here to the next graph, because, so remember, the rule is keep hiring workers, and I still have this downward sloping demand, which is my marginal revenue product, my willingness to pay for the next worker, if that's above marginal factor cost, I'm going to keep hiring workers. So that's how I determine my profit maximizing quantity. I'm going to get my quantity of labor by setting marginal revenue product equal to marginal factor cost. But I'm going to pay the lowest wage that I can in order to attract these Q1 workers. So the, the lowest wage I can I can pay is, is going down to my supply curve and paying W1, right? Just like when I had a marginal, uh, a uh, monopoly with a marginal cost curve, right? So I didn't put it in here, but marginal cost curve would be somewhere over here, right? I would determine the quantity there, but I'm going to, I'm going to charge the highest amount I could at that particular quantity, which is up on my demand curve. So I have market power. I'm going to charge that highest price I can. Here I have market power in this labor market. I'm going to pay the lowest wage I can and still attract those Q1 workers. So I'm going to find my point here, and then go down to my supply curve. That's the wage that this firm is going to pay. Um, so this monopsony is hiring this much, um, this many units of labor, and paying that wage. Okay, just a little, a couple other minor things. Um, we were assuming that our market supply of labor is upward sloping, um, which is a reasonable assumption. But it's just telling us at a higher wage, um, more workers are willing to work um, quantity supplied increases. Um, but if we look at an individual labor curve, um, it may be that we have two effects going on here when the wage increases. So the just like on, on a demand any demand curve, we have this substitution effect where you're substituting away from something that's becoming relatively more expensive. You're substituting towards something that becomes relatively cheaper. So here the trade-off that we're looking at is you know, if I'm deciding to work more, then I'm then I'm taking less leisure and vice versa. So I'm sort of substituting work and leisure, work and not working. Um, and so when the wage goes up, um, leisure becomes relatively more expensive. I get a better return from working, and so I'm substituting towards more work, or people are substituting towards more work. So that's the substitution effect, right? Just work work is becoming relatively um, more attractive. It's it's the wage is going up relative to other things, and so substitution effect says that we should have this upward sloping relationship. But there's also an income effect, which is the higher wage that I get, um, the richer I'm getting, the more income that I have in total. And so the richer I am, other things being equal, since leisure is a normal good, um, it suggests that at some point if my income is high enough, I actually want to work less. So you could get an individual supply curve that actually bends backward. Um, so in this portion, the substitution effect would be dominating the, in the income effect. But at some point, imagine if your wage was high enough, um, I don't want to just keep adding more hours to my day. At some point, um, that income effect is, is dominating, and I actually want to work less. Um, and so you could actually get this backward bending relationship between quantity supplied and wage. However, since we're usually just looking at the market supply curve, 
um, we can assume that someone is willing to enter this market at a higher wage pretty much along this whole you know whatever range we're looking at so for the market we can just draw it as upward sloping so it may not be the same people that are supplying more and more labor but someone's willing to to supply labor as as we keep um, raising that wage so for the market we can just draw it as upward sloping we don't really have to worry about the any kind of backward bending supply curve um, but it's a good example we see income and substitution effects a lot in various applications in economics and this is another one